Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Health for the World Radiology Ground Rounds. Thank you for joining. We are so happy to have you here. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box and tell us where you're logging in from. We will have a QA session after the lecture, so please add any questions you may have in the QA box. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this week, Dr. Renny Model. We are honored to have you today. And um, she will be giving a talk on therapy of bone pain. Dr. Model is an attending physician in the Department of Radiology and Associate Professor of Nuclear Medicine and Medicine at Montefiore Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Bronx, New York. She is also the Director of Nuclear Medicine Residency Program at Montefiore Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Dr. Model received her MD degree in Master of Clinical Research at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She completed her postgraduate training with a residency in medicine and nuclear medicine and a chief residency in nuclear medicine and a fellowship in nuclear medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Dr. Model has extensive experience in all aspects of nuclear medicine and her professional interest in nuclear medicine includes the use of therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals in oncology. Hi, Dr. Model. We are really honored to have you here today, and thank you so much for joining. Please um, start whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, therapy of cancers is uh, one of my favorite things. I love to just get the cancer and kill it. Um, and you know, we're going to be mainly probably talking about radium uh, two twenty three. But um, but you know there are, there are many other uh, up and coming and, and just released radio pharmaceuticals uh, uh, for therapy of cancers and uh, we're just very excited about all of this. So let's talk about therapy of bone metastases. So there are two radio pharmaceuticals that are quite old. Uh, which had not been used, which are not really in use. I'm just going to review them uh, briefly, um, and then we'll we'll get into uh, radium uh, 223. We'll we'll also uh, look at a little bit of the history of radium use, which is very interesting. Um, uh, radium 223 decay, the Alcimca trial, um, uh, survival, and uh, skeletal related related events, and we'll also look at radium-223 and osteosarcoma and breast cancer. So just briefly, strontium-89 is a beta emitter with a half-life of 50 days. Uh, four millicuries is administered to the patient. Uh, platelets need to be greater than 60,000. White blood count uh, needs to be greater than 2.4. And the nadir is expected 12 to 16 weeks later. 16, 63% of um, patients uh, experience decrease in bone pain um, at six months after therapy, as opposed to 35% with placebo. And this is uh, a urinary excretion. So we have uh, radiation safety precautions for that. Uh, Stranium was uh, evaluated in conjunction with chemo and hormone therapy uh, for prostate cancer and did not show a clinical benefit. Briefly, samarium uh, also is a beta emitter, had, has the added quote unquote a benefit of gamma emissions in that you can image the patient, but then they also go home and radiate their family. So the half-life is shorter, only 46 hours. Uh, one millicurie per kilogram is administered. There's no guidance for platelets or white blood count, but the nadir is expected in three to five weeks. Um, and the area under the pain curve was lower at four weeks as opposed to placebo. Again, urinary excretion. So patients who are incontinent uh, need to have uh, precautions. Uh, Samarium-153, together with chemotherapy, um, uh, the, uh, in, in terms of docetaxel, uh, had a bone marrow, was the, the uh, limiting toxicity, 
And in osteosarcoma, given together with high-dose chemotherapy and uh, autologous stem cell transplant, the median uh, progression-free survival was 79 days. Um, and uh, this is a, in prostate cancer overall survival with 14 months, uh, single-arm trials. So um, let's just uh, review prostate cancer very briefly, most common cancer in men, second most common cause of cancer death, risks include African ancestry, family history, age greater than 50, testing with PSA is um, uh, fraught with uh, controversy. Therapies include for uh, localized disease, surgery, external beam radiation therapy, or a radioactive seed implant implantation. For um, more uh, systemic disease, there's hormonal therapy, chemotherapies, radiation therapy uh, to, to uh, metastatic sites, or the combination, for example, for advanced disease, and now we have a lutetium-177 PSMA or Pluvitco. Um, and increased re risk of death is seen in patients with obesity and who are smokers. Uh, patients who have localized disease, most patients have an excellent five-year survival. A regional disease, also excellent five-year survival. Distant disease, and these are the patients we're talking about, um, have only 32% five-year survival. So let's talk about like way back when in the early 1900s uh, about radium as a therapeutic agent. This is just a very uh, sort of interesting uh, throwback in history. Uh, so the mechanism of action of radium is that it's a calcium analog. So it replaces cal calcium um, within the bone uh, and so it was used, let's see here, standard radium preparations, uh, the radium uh, chemical company in Pittsburgh and New York and Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, um, the value of radium is unquestionably established in chronic and subacute arthritis of all kinds, Luetic and tuberculous accepted for acute, subacute, and chronic joint and muscular rheumato rheumatism, so called, in gout, sciatica, neuralgia, polyneuritis, lumbago, and the lancinating pain of TBs. So, this is actually reported in JAMA in 1918, and um, this was sold uh, to people. Uh, I think it was over the counter, or maybe uh, it might have been doctor prescribed. I'm not sure. But there was a whole journal, just the way we have the Journal of Nuclear Medicine or uh, radiology journals. Um, There's a whole journal dedicated to radium, a monthly journal devoted to the chemistry, physics, and therapeutics of radium and radioactive substances. Um, this was just one issue uh, in April 1914. Uh, and eventually, so this was in 1914, eventually in 1932, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, it was reported that the radium water worked fine until his jaw came off. So uh, this is a guy by the name of Eben Byers, uh, who is a socialite and um, I guess businessman and stock time stated that he died of radium poisoning after several years of consumption of radiothor, cause of death was stated as necrosis of the jaw, abscess of the brain, secondary anemia, and terminal pneumonia. They actually exhumed his remains in 1965, and they uh, calculated that he ingested 5,000 microcuries of radium and consumed 1,400 bottles. So this is Eben Byers. This is radiothor. And this is his jaw that fell off. Um, so it was initially prescribed for arm pain and then he was an avid proponent consuming vast quantities and giving cases to his friends. He also gave some to his horse. So I don't think we know about the, the burial site of the horse, 
but we do know about um, his burial site. Uh, and his uh, body was exhumed. Uh, they scanned his remains and the, the, they're mostly uh, alpha and beta emissions. So this is uh, some Bremsstrahlen uh, imaging of some of, of some of his bones. And then he was reinterred in a lead line coffin. So let's talk about um, another uh, parallel story that was occurring, which was the watch dial industry. Um, so Dr. Uh, Coons and Merton, uh, this was in the New York Times in 1904. Radium act and actinium were discussed last night before the Technology Club of, of New York in the operating rooms of Dr. William J. Wharton. Um, Drs. Coons and Morton uh, uh, is a professor of electrotherapeutics at New York Postgraduate Medical School and Hospital. In order to carry out the experiment, it was necessary to extinguish all the lights in the room. Um, Dr. Kunz took from his pocket a small piece of radium, the size of a pinhead, which was uh, 100,000 activity. They didn't even have millicuries or, or gigabecquerels or anything. And it uh, cost nearly 30, 30, $300 and it glowed in the dark. And they were very excited about this. Um, and so uh, Dr. Coons uh, decided he, um, he used this to paint the hands of his wristwatch so he could read it in the dark. And he then developed a radium paint called Undark and founded the US Radium Corporation in Orange, New Jersey, which is now an EPA Superfund site. So, uh, you know, painting these uh, dials uh, enabled them to be seen in the dark. So what was happening around a little bit after 1903 was um, the number one, uh, people really wanted uh, things that they could see in the dark. But num number two, what happened was World War II. So uh, to be able to see cockpit pit dials or uh, watch dials in the dark was an advantage uh, within the war. And uh, there was another uh, factory in, in outside Illinois, uh, in, in Illinois, sorry, outside Chicago, uh, where you can see um, some, some of these people are women and some of these people are girls. They're, you know, they haven't finished high school. Um, and they're working in this industry and they're painting the dials. And they were instructed to paint with a paintbrush and to tip the paintbrush in their mouth in order to uh, get the point very, uh, very sharp and to accurately paint the watch dials. Um, this is one of the uh, World War One. I'm sorry, I, I think I said World War Two earlier. I meant World World War One. So uh, World War One. This is one of the watches uh, from World War One that was painted by these uh, ladies and girls, uh, so that the soldier could see this in the dark. And um, and these women uh, subsequently ingested a a significant amount of radium, and we'll go over what isotopes they are. But um, in later years, they developed sarcomas and carcinomas. Uh, they also uh, had uh, fragility fractures and also all sorts of, 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 health, of health issues. Uh, they were studied um, by uh, Argonne National Lab, um, uh, for many, many years, actually, and they were they were scanned to see how much they had ingested. So uh, this were the these were the early years when um, the ladies and girls were tipping the brush in their mouth, um, and this this is World War II. So um, after they were 
they figured out, it took them a while to figure it out, to figure out exactly what was the cause of all of these uh, cancers and so forth. Um, the dial workers were advised to stop tipping the brush within the mouth. No uh, subsequent uh, malignancies were seen. Um, and this is the uh, systemic intake of radium and microcuries. So there seemed to be sort of a limit of uh, 100 microcuries above which um, uh, many women uh, sustained uh, cancers. Um, so the effects of radium poisoning were jaw necrosis, meaning their jaws would fall off too, uh, osteomyelitis, sarcomas, multiple myeloma, uh, epidermoid carcinomas of the nasopharynx, uh, bone fractures, and shorter lifespan overall. So uh, again, so World War II increased demand, um, and, and again, uh, glow in the dark instrumentation was needed and knowledge about the hazards of radium was sufficient to protect the workers. Uh, and employees hired during World War II years showed no increase in diseases and no radium induced malignancies. So, um, there was a book written recently um, which documented the suffering and subsequent um, uh, uh, rules for the workplace for acquired illness, and which is now like sort of the OSHA. Um, and uh, I, I think that these women uh, went through a very hard time, but they really fought for themselves. And they fought for um, not just women, but or girls in the workplace, but all employees in the work, workplace. Um, they fought for uh, safe workplaces and for uh, the workplace to, uh, you know, have have accountability. Uh, this is one of the lovely ladies who. Uh, before you know, before she started working, or uh, at at one of the uh, paint uh, factories, and this is one of you know. This is I'm not sure if this is a jaw osteomyelitis or if this is an osteosarcoma, but you know there are multiple. This occurred to multiple multiple of the uh, women and girls, and then they subsequently made a movie about them. I read the book. I, I haven't seen the movie. Uh, so what were the isotopes used uh, in the radium of the watch dials? So, and also for even buyers, radium-226 and radium-228. So what, what is radium-226? So radium-226 um, has a half-life of 1,600 years, uh, and it packs a punch. Alpha, 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 beta, beta, alpha, beta, beta, alpha, until, you know. So this is very long half-life, a lot of harm. Um, and uh, just as a corollary, a polonium-210 was used to poison uh, the former Russian KGB agent, uh, Litvenko, who was living in England at the time. And so that was just one alpha. And these uh, ladies and girls and even buyers had all of the, the, this other stuff going on. Um, and uh, radium-228, also beta, beta, alpha, 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 beta, beta, alpha, uh, packs a huge punch, half-life 5.8 years. So uh, these are not great things to ingest. Um, so let's talk about radium-223. Uh, so radium-223 has a half-life of 11 days. So it's a little bit more manageable in terms of uh, being, um, you know, in, in terms of its toxicity. It also packs a similar punch, alpha, 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 beta, alpha, beta. Um, and each alpha has a quality factor of 20, meaning it's 20 times more 
uh, damaging to tissue than a gamma or a beta. So um, it's mostly alphas, 4% beta, very small gamma emissions. And uh, they've scanned a few patients with this gamma emission only when they, they've given larger doses. Um, so uh, average tissue uh, range is 100 microns. Uh, and the combined energy of radium and the daughters is 28 uh, MeV. And you can see the alpha particle, uh, two protons, two neutrons being ejected from the nucleus. And it runs right through the DNA and causes double strand DNA breakage. Studies in prostate cancer. So first there was a dose escalation study um, where they uh, studied 15 patients with prostate and breast cancer with bony metastases. They gave a single injection of several different uh, dose levels and they determined that all dose levels were safe. Pain relief was seen in 50% of patients. It was rapidly cleared from the blood and eliminated in the intestines and the side effects were mild and transient diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, mild reversible myelosuppression with the meter at two to four weeks, and median survival exceeded 20 months. So um, in one of the higher dose levels, they were able to scan one patient. This is the MDP scan of the patient, and you can see the bony metastases. And um, you can see the bony metastases on the radium scan as well, here and here, just the, the imaging is uh, not great because it's a, uh, the, the, the gamma emission is not uh, very frequent. And you can see the excretion in the gastrointestinal uptake, which is the reason for the diarrhea and nausea and vomiting. Um, I'll just add a, a corollary. The ma majority of patients are on opioids who come for ra radium therapy. And so they're already constipated and almost none of my patients have really experienced this, this diarrhea or, or nausea or vomiting. Um, so uh, they then uh, went about a phase two study design um, uh, and men with advanced hormone refractory prostate cancer and multiple bony metastasis and at least one pa painful lesion um, uh, had their ALKFAS uh, decreased by 65%. The time to PSA progression was 26 weeks versus eight weeks for placebo. And the hazard ratio for a skeletal uh, fracture was uh, 1.75 for the placebo group, and the overall survival was 65 weeks for the treatment group versus 46 weeks for a placebo group. And, um, and the hazard ratio for uh, overall survival was two for the placebo group, for, for death was two for the placebo group. And there were no significant side effects at that dose level which is the dose level we're currently using. And um, the organs with the highest absorbed dose include the bone and osteum, which is where the tumors are. Uh, the red marrow is further down. We have some liver and GI tract. Uh, the liver is uh, a bit more uh, radiation resistant. Uh, and you can see here uh, the, the colon So mechanism action, the radium um, is integrated into bone as calcium is. Uh, there's the range of the alpha particle. There's nearby tumors, uh, which uh, the cells are uh, DNA damaged. And the bone marrow is further from the tumor. Uh, it's not as close, not most, the majority of marrow is not that close to the bone end osteum. And so it remains relatively unaffected 
by the radiation. And in uh, just uh, briefly, the phase two overall survival data, um, there were uh, 50, there were 30% alive at 24 months versus placebo, 13% alive. And this is the Kaplan-Meier curve with a, a significant p-value. Uh, so how did we decide on 50 millicurie, like 50 kilobecquerels per kilogram versus 25 or 80 or so forth? Um, so they did another uh, trial looking at um, uh, several injections every week, uh, every six weeks, sorry. And um, they saw that the 50 and 80 uh, kilobecquerels uh, the change in, in PSA, so the PSA rose less slowly, uh, less, less quickly, sorry, um, at these dose levels, and 25 um, PSA rose more quickly. And um, the ALKFAS level decreased the same amount with the 50 and 80, uh, but did not crease, decrease as much with 25. Uh, so they figured that the 50 would be preferable because it's a lower dose and you're seeing the same effects. Um, and all dose levels, um, there was no significant change in uh, pain response. So all dose levels uh, had a pain response, but actually the 50 uh, kilobecquerel group had a really, really nice pain response. Uh, and there were no significant uh, adverse events. Uh, these are grade one adverse events. Uh, um, uh, there were a couple of uh, platelet and hemoglobin in the 50 and uh, 80 kilobecquerel kilo per kilogram uh, dose levels. Uh, so that brought us to the Alsimka trial, which is the pivotal trial um, having this approved by the FDA. So uh, this is a phase three randomized controlled trial of men with castrate resistant uh, prostate cancer and symptomatic bone metastases. Um, patients uh, received 50 kilobecquerel per kilogram at uh, six injections, four weeks apart, and the study was terminated uh, due to an interim analysis showing um, improved overall survival with the radium group. Uh, patients were stratified based on uh, uh, whether or not their ALKFOS was uh, lower than or above 220, whether or not they had prior bisphosphonate use, or whether or not they had prior docetaxel. And they were randomized two to one, two patients uh, for every one that uh, received placebo, two patients received radium. And the endpoints were overall survival, time to skeletal events, time to ALKFAS and PSA progression, safety, quality of life. Uh, so this was this was the it, you know. Uh, these patients who received radium uh, had a longer overall survival, 14 months versus 11 months. And uh, in terms of skeletal related events, uh, the it. It's the, uh, the area between the two curves. So the radium patients had skeletal or re related events later than the placebo group. So even though there's a crossover here, there are also very few patients at this, uh, at this end point. So the time to ALKFAS progression uh, for patients who received uh, radium, the hazard ratio was 0.16, a very high p-value, time to PSA progression, 0.67, high p-value. And they did subgroup, subgroup analyses. So um, the study's not powered for any of these, but um, all, of, all of these, um, uh, whether or not there were prior docetaxel, prior bisphosphonate, the ALKFAS level, um, it didn't seem to uh, matter in terms of favoring radium 223. Uh, ECOG status, um, if the ECOG status was two or higher, so those were uh, with poor uh, uh, 
uh, poor, uh, I guess, symptomatology uh, maybe did, didn't benefit, but again, this was not powered for this. So this is not really used in the determination as to who should get radium. Uh, so in terms of adverse events, which this is like one of my favorite slides. So um, placebo was discontinued more often than radium uh, due to adverse events. Um, and there were more serious adverse events in the placebo group uh, versus the radium group um, and more grade three or four events in the placebo group versus the radium group. So um, I just thought that this was somewhat interesting. Um, patients were more likely to have diarrhea or vomiting in the radium group versus placebo transient. Um, I, again, I don't really see this in clinical practice. Uh, and based on this, uh, it was fast-tracked accelerated approval um, by the FDA, uh, and just like other drugs um, that have been rapidly approved, Gleevec for CML, uh, drugs for HIV AIDS, uh, drugs for hepatitis C virus, and uh, vaccines and therapies for COVID-19. Here's one patient uh, who was in pain. Uh, this is his baseline bone scan demonstrating multiple uh, bony metastases. And after five doses of radium, uh, there was you know, quite marked resolution uh, of the bony metastasis on, on bone scan. And you know, it's supposed to slow PSA progression, but his PSA actually decreased from 130 to 74, and his ALKFOS decreased from 203 to 172. Uh, he, however, did remain symptomatic, and we think that this was likely due to degenerative disease, and then he ended up undergoing um, a, a spinal level injection uh, for uh, degenerative pain, and that that helped to resolve, resolve his pain. But he did, he did quite well as well symptomatically. Um, in terms of uh, other side effects, he had no other side effects. So uh, radium, so the, the hazard ratio of radium versus placebo, um, and if you look at some of the other uh, I guess, newer chemotherapy regimens versus what they were comp compared to, um, the hazard ratio for uh, death is lower. And um, it's similar to all of these uh, uh, chemo or hormonal therapy regimens uh, with a similar p-value. So the next step is the addition of radium to um, these other adjuvant therapies, like what can, what can we expect? So uh, in terms of long-term safety, uh, hematologic adverse events occurred more frequently in patients who had uh, prior cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, the non-chemotherapy group had a lower burden of disease and was more li likely to complete radium therapy. Some patients, um, uh, I, I guess a lot of um, oncologists uh, prescribe radium-223 sort of at the end of the line. And there's a lot of marrow infiltration of tumors. So the marrow is already uh, very burdened and uh, the radium-223 is not as, as well tolerated. And uh, selected patients were able to tolerate a second round of radium-223 therapy. We've tried to have this, um, we had one patient who did very well with radium and wanted it a second time. We were unable to have his insurance company uh, approve a second, a second round. So um, what about radium with abiraterone and prednisone? This is not a great idea. So uh, we actually participated in this trial. Uh, the, uh, it's an, 
abiraterone is an androgen biosynthesis inhibitor and um, reduces corticosteroid production. So it's given in combination with prednisone. And these patients had an increased risk of fracture and there was no survival benefit. So this is actually a contraindication uh, for radium therapy, um, but it is being studied with uh, paclitaxel and zalutamide, docetaxel and Cepelucel T, I'm very bad at pronouncing that one. Uh, with paclitaxel, it's well tolerated and uh, we're, we're awaiting further data of, of survival. Um, so let's look at enzalutamide. So the, uh, it inhibits, inhibits binding of androgen receptors and there is uh, no risk of uh, fracture or adverse events. There is increased uh, time from start of protocol therapy to PSA progression on a subsequent therapy. So this is kind of a little bit of a weird uh, endpoint, but this is what they found. And they also had a uh, bone marker improvement after, after therapy, multiple bone markers. What about radium therapy with docetaxel? So docetaxel inhibits microtubule depolymerization. Uh, the um, treatment uh, emergent adverse events. So patients who were on docetaxel alone had uh, emergent adverse events 62% of the time, whereas the addition of radium, they had less events and the time to PSA progression improved. Uh, so this is the uh, time to PSA progression uh, of radium plus docetaxel versus, rate, uh, versus docetaxel alone. And Cepolucel uh, T is an FDA approved autol autologous cell-based immunotherapy. Um, and uh, combined with radium, uh, progression-free survival, this was, you know, this is just a phase two study, so it's not yet statistically significant, but this is certainly promising for a possible, uh, uh, you know, more study. Uh, and this is overall survival. So, so let's look at osteosarcoma. So there was a dose escalation study uh, performed and the rec recommended phase two dose um, in osteosarcoma is twice that of prostate cancer, 100 kilobecquerels per, per kilogram. And patients were evaluated with sodium fluoride PET, which uh, revealed more, more metastases than both bone scan and FDG PET imaging. Um, among 18 patients, it's a very small study because osteosarcoma is not that common. Um, one patient had a metabolic response on both FDG and sodium fluoride. Four patients had mis mixed response and uh, one patient had response in brain metastasis. The median overall survival was 25 weeks. Uh, six month overall survival was 48% and 12 month only 9%. Uh, uh, L decrease in uh, LDH had some correlation with overall survival, but it was not statistically significant due to small sample size. This is just one patient. Uh, uh, this is sodium fluoride uh, PET scan with a very large osteosarcoma in the pelvis and on uh, subsequent imaging after three and six doses of radium you can see a uh, response. And um, what about radium in combination with chemotherapy and SBRT? Again, a small study, uh, 15 patients, median age of 19 years. Most patients had three doses of radium-223 until ox there was extra osseous progression of disease. Um, uh, 
there's a 60% decrease median in alkaline phosphatase. Uh, four patients did not receive SBRT and, uh, and or only one agent of chemotherapy. And they had a median survival of 4.3 months and 11 patients had SBRT and more than one chemotherapeutic agent. And these patients uh, had a median overall survival of 13 months. Um, 14 of 15 uh, patients remained ECOG zero with excellent quality of life, and one patient remains alive uh, 2.5 years later. Uh, so this is the survival curve. There's no, there, there's no uh, placebo here. And uh, this is showing one patient with osteosarcoma uh, extensive disease. Um, partial response on sodium fluoride PET after one dose of radium and the patient was subsequently able to walk. So definitely increased quality of life. Studies in breast cancer. So breast cancer is not a bone dominant disease, um, but there have been studies of uh, bone predominant breast cancer. It's safe and well tolerated. Um, at week nine uh, on FDG PET imaging, 50 lesions had a 32% metabolic response. And at week 17, uh, the, uh, the 50 lesions had a 41% met metabolic response. Um, the problem is that there was a lot of mixed response. Um, you know, some responded, some lesions didn't respond at all. And here you can see on FDG PET imaging, one lesion became worse, one was stable. On sodium fluoride imaging, uh, became worse. This one got better. So it's a lot of mixed, um, mixed response. Um, uh, this uh, one particular patient had, had her CA27.29 decrease um, and ALKFOS decreased and pain, imp pain improved after one treatment. Uh, so uh, there's a current uh, trial in the UK ongoing capcitabine and radium in breast cancer with bone mets, um, a phase 1B slash 2A, and this is the, the study protocol. We'll see what happens with that. Um, and there, uh, there was a, uh, a phase two study of radium and hormone therapy in bone dominant breast cancer. Uh, 35 patients were treated. Uh, there was disease uh, control rate at nine months was 49%. Um, and there was tumor response by the persist criteria, 54% at six months. And uh, progression-free survival was 7.4 months and bone PFS was 16 months. And there were no uh, grade three, four adverse events. So the story of breast cancer, um, I don't think that radium is a slam dunk for breast cancer, mainly because of the extra osseous, uh, predominance of extra osseous disease in this entity. Um, and so we've gone over a lot and I think we've progressed. And uh, I'd like also in prostate cancer, in any case, I'd like to see how Pluvico changes the equation um, as to whether or not we'll be seeing as many radium referrals. Um, and also uh, the effects on bone marrow and how that may affect uh, if Pluvico is used first, how, um, how the bone marrow uh, effects of radium uh, may occur if it's used as a later therapy. But we've graduated from one place to another. And here's my son. He graduated high school. Then he graduated college. Now he's starting grad school after working for a year. 
So um, I would like to entertain questions from the audience. Uh, doc, Dr. Mustavi, you, I, I think you're on mute. Sorry, thank you so much, Dr. Modo. It was such a very interesting topic and very comprehensive lecture. I personally enjoyed and learned so much. Um, I would like to ask audience, if you have any questions, please uh, use the QA box and submit your questions. Um, I also wanted to ask that for um, evaluation of treatment response. So um, do we use um, any kind of like um, criteria such as prostate cancer group or those criteria to evaluate treatment response for uh, radio pharmaceuticals as well? Um, in terms of radium 223, uh, it's just, based on uh, the data, the, the, like following the PSA or following the LDH is not useful because it's supposed to slow the increase. So if it increases, you don't know if it would have increased more aggressively without the radium. Um, so when I speak with my referring physicians, they say, hey, the PSA is increasing should we continue radium? And I basically say, uh, according to the, the survival data, if the patient's tolerating uh, therapy to continue because of the survival benefit. Great, and do we like to uh, evaluate treatment response for any criteria like besides progression for survival? Do we use like PCWG2 or PCWG3 for evaluation of response or do we just rely on um, kids um, and progression for PFS? Oh, I, we actually don't rely on anything. We just sort of, because of the way the study was done, they, they did not use any imaging modality. They um, did see the serum markers increase, but increase more slowly. So um, the uh, oncologists are drawing lactose dehydrate, uh, LDH, and, and they're drawing PSA frequently because the patients want to know, and they want to know. Um, but it's sort of just ac according to the study, I don't think that anything else is really necessary. Thank you. And for um, monitoring the um, adverse um, events, like how, um, how the intervals are um, being advised? So we uh, do a, a CBC uh, a few days prior to each uh, subsequent therapy. And if the uh, platelet level is less than 50 and the absolute neutrophil count is less than, I think it's 1.5, then we don't go ahead with, we, we will delay the subsequent therapy or um, to see if the bone marrow improves, if the bone marrow does not improve, we'll cease therapy at that time. Thank you so much. And I don't see any questions because it was so comprehensive and you covered see, all that. I like, see Dr. Bashir uh, asked, uh, do you anticipate decrease of radium-223 in favor of lutetium-177 PSMA in the future? And I have to say that um, it's been approved by the FDA of the US, but it has not yet been approved by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid services, so they're not paying for it yet. So um, our hospital is largely Medicare and Medicaid, so we have not been using PSMA yet, but we're gonna have to see how that plays out um, in, in terms of uh, 
I, I would assume uh, it, the PSMA would also treat non-bony disease. So uh, the radium is only treating bony disease and bony disease that's causing bony turnover, whereas PSMA will be treating disease elsewhere. So uh, we're going to have to see how that plays out. It may decrease our referral rate for radium-223. I think that that will be a, a very interesting question. And also, if it'll also be interesting to see if uh, patients who have gotten uh, lutetium-177 PSMA, uh, the bone marrow, subsequent bone marrow effects, whether, whether later in the course of disease, they'll be able to tolerate radium-223. So we'll have to We'll have to see what uh, what happens with that, and that that's that's future vision. Are there any other questions? I'd be happy to entertain. Yeah, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, taking your time and having this session. It was very interesting and helpful, and we are so happy and honored to have you. Um, thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you, Dr. Mosafavi. Very, very happy to uh, work with you and to, uh, to uh, I, I, I love the Health for the World lectures. I think they're, they're amazing, they're remarkable, and, and thank you for hosting me. Sure, thank you so much for your contribution. Hope you have a good rest of the day. And, and everyone. Thank you everyone for joining around, us. Around the world. Thank you.